Hey everybody, Gina Davis here. How you doing? Thanks for uh, for joining me here. I'm, I'm uh, with a lot of books that I wrote. Uh, my first book, and uh, it's a it's a memoir called "Dying of Politeness." Uh, and if you don't get the joke right away, uh, I'm having tea with a bear who's going to kill me. But I'm so polite, I give him a little a little tea and cake first. Uh, and this this picture actually on the back cover was another option that we had for the for the cover. There was going to be um, this, I'm curtsying, and I was going to be curtsying to the Grim Reaper uh, as another you know just pun on the on the title. Another idea I had I mean, it wouldn't have been appropriate probably, but uh, was going to be that I'm uh, I'm I'm about to be executed, and uh, there's a you know, a guy with a hood on, you know, the, the big, with the big axe and everything. And, uh, and as I'm heading to the place where you put your neck down, I'm, I'm handing him a thank you note, uh, because I'm very polite. Uh, anyway, but, uh, this, uh, this book, the, my other, uh, description of it is my journey to badassery. And that's what the t uh, name of the first chapter is, uh, because, it, it turns out that a lot of people think of me as being a badass because of roles that I've played. And, uh, and the fact is that I was a badass on screen a long time before I was in real life. Now I'm, I'm getting close to being able to actually uh, accept the label of being a badass. There was an article in the Mary Sue that uh, was titled, Gina Davis is the baddest badass ever to badass. And I was like, all right, I like that. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, I've had a circuitous journey to try to get to a place where my, I feel like the, uh, the mission of my life is to close the gap between when something happens to me and when I am able to react authentically. You know how you have a lot of uh, occasions where you say, oh, later you think, I wish I, I know what I would have said if I had thought of it. Um, and that was sort of my life. Uh, and, um, and, and, and part of it was, you know, how I was raised to be incredibly, um, not just polite, but, but uh, to not have needs, to be very self-effacing and not um, impose anything on anybody else, whether it's accepting uh, an offer of, uh, you know, refreshment at their house or, uh, you know, having uh, the choices. Because I, like, I had a horrible time when I first started uh, dating because they want to know where did I, what kind of food did I want to have. Oh, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't matter. Man, maybe I don't even have to have food. Uh, so. Uh, so my life has been sort of a journey to try to to deal with that and uh, become someone who can say, hey, here's what I think, without starting with, uh, I don't know what you'll think. This is probably a stupid idea, and you don't have to do it. But, uh, you know, that, that's how I had lived most of my life. But I don't anymore, except I'm sorry that I said that. Uh, so I'm going to be signing some books. If you would like an autographed book, which I will do right now, um, go to Premier Collectibles, Premier with an E on the end, collectibles.com slash politeness. And don't die of politeness. This is, my, this is my advice to you. And now I am going to start signing these books. And, uh, and I'm going to be answering questions. So uh, let's start that part. First, I'll sign the first book. Yeah, yeah, okay. Question time. The first one is from Curtis in Edmon Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Curtis. Yeah, Curtis. He wants to know, will I ever see you as a participant on the television show Dancing with the Stars? Have you been asked yet? I have been asked to. I have been asked to. And, uh, and I, would, I would really like to do it. I re you know, I, I don't dance, but I, I like to try to learn new physical things, sports and uh, uh, skills. And um, so, but I don't think I want to. 
because they get really good. You know, people get really. I don't want to be, you know, the Sean Spicer who gets kicked <laughs> off in the beginning. Uh, I think I could probably do pretty good, but I don't want to. It's like I, I will never be on um, Celebrity Jeopardy because I have a reputation of being very smart, and I do not want to ruin that by uh, by going on Jeopardy because there's whole categories. You know, there were certain categories I would know everything. And there's whole uh, sections of, you know, interest for people that I know absolutely nothing about. And I don't want to display that. But I'm just displaying that fact by telling you this. But, uh, yeah, so I, I won't be on that. <laughs> uh, Barry in Nottingham, UK says, um, what was it like working with Jeff Goldblum and David Cronenberg on the fly? It's an oddly sweet film, but it looks like it was very hard to shoot. Can't wait for the book. Big love from Nottingham, Barry. Hey, hi, Barry. So uh, it was the experience of a lifetime to work on that movie. Uh, I was already with Jeff Goldblum who were a couple, and he had got cast first and um, recommended me for the, for the part. And I had never had a lead part uh, by any means and recommended me for the lead part. And the producers were a little worried about it because what if we broke up during the filming or something, but there, you know, there was no chance of that. Uh, and, um, and David Cronenberg is a genius. He's an incredible um, filmmaker and also a person. I mean, just he's so smart and warm and, and it's, you wouldn't picture perhaps David Cronenberg being so normal and smart and, and more um, and smart, yes, but but you know just very normal. I, I felt like he looked like uh, your dentist or, or something like that. And yet, what's in his mind is pretty extraordinary. Um, but we love that movie, and I agree with you that it's very it's a very touching romance, which people who haven't seen it might not realize. It's a, it's a sort of operatic romance because. The stakes are so huge, uh, and uh, and just so despite there being um, some gore in there, some bloody scenes and uh, things going on, um, it's at, at its heart. It's a it's a very um, it's a tragedy. All right, William from Scranton, Pennsylvania says what's, what's the name William. William, okay. Miss Davis, you are one of my favorite actors. One of my favorite films of yours is Earth Girls Are Easy, which has a great ensemble cast. I also think you have a fantastic comedic chemistry with Julie Brown. Can you tell us a little something about making the film and will you be a part of the upcoming Blu-ray release in November? The, uh, the Blu-ray release in November? Will you be a part of the Blu-ray release in November? Maybe he knows something you don't. He knows, uh, uh, <laughs> William, I hope they're not leaving me out of something. Uh, certainly, they couldn't do it without me. Uh, so we'll see. But um, uh, thank you. I love that movie, too. You know, I, I sometimes joke about it. And I say um, uh, I've only played role models. Uh, when I, when I, like, they give me a speech or something, I say, you know, I care about women's presentation I've only played role models and then pause and and if people start laughing I say well I wasn't a movie called those girls or anything uh but uh uh but I love that film I think it's really cool and funny and uh, that's why I really wanted to be in it and Julie Brown is hilarious and we had a good time but but yeah people might not realize um the cast was was actually quite extraordinary uh, Michael McKeon was the pool guy, and Julie Brown, of course, was in it. And uh, Jeff Goldblum was the blue alien, who was very hot once he got shaved. And the red alien was um, Jim Carrey. Uh, and you know, early days, people didn't really know Jim Carrey much yet. And the yellow one was Damon Wayans. So between the three of them, I mean, it was. Uh, it was really hilarious on set. And there was a lot of improvising, and those guys you know, are super funny. So we, we had a great time. I love that movie. 
<laughs> Speaking of your roles, Jesse in Cyblo, Texas wants to know, is there a role that you've turned down that you wish you hadn't? And then what was it and what were they, if it's multiple? What was, uh, what was the role that is, are there any roles that you've right. turned down right. that, you, you know, you wish you hadn't, what were they or right. what was it? I'm sorry. I think I'm, I'm, I'm uh, personally deaf. Oh, so I'm I, very I, Southern. I, I, so, so thank you. Uh, I um, so there's, there's only one film that I could maybe feel like I should have, um, thought about doing uh but i don't want to say what it is you know I, I i don't like when people say who was up for something before them or or anything like you know in other words that you were considered for a part that then went to somebody else because it feels like you know bragging i wouldn't want somebody to say well i beat out gina davis you know what i mean so um but there is and and the reason was like i i was i sort of didn't get get it get this movie um, completely, and the guy's part was much more interesting than the woman's part, um, the boyfriend more than the girlfriend, and uh, and it was a giant hit. It was a gigantic hit, and this was fairly early in my career, so it wouldn't have hurt to be in, it, in an enormous hit, but things worked out anyway. <laughs> um. Thomas in Switzerland says, uh, yeah, we ship internationally, guys. Uh, what is your favorite character in your career? So, Thomas, um, you know, I, I, every time somebody asks me this, I, I waver because uh, I, it would be very natural to say uh, Thelma in Thelma Louise. I mean, that script was the best script I ever read. It was the most extraordinary, you know, it was a film that had an enormous impact. And I got to play a character who goes from, you know, a sort of mousy housewife to a suicidal road warrior, um, which, you know, is extremely rare for women to have a part that, that big an arc. But I'm also always tempted to say Charlie Baltimore in Long Kiss Goodnight, because it's the same a uh, terrifically big arc. I go from an amnesiac uh, cookie baking uh, mom to uh, a deadly assassin in the space of just, you know, a couple of days. Uh, so, I mean, that was, and that was, and it had the added attraction of having, uh, of being an action movie that I got to do all these sense of, you know, women, especially back then, uh, had so few opportunities to do um, action roles, play action roles, uh, and not be, you know, maybe in an action movie, but you're the one being rescued instead of the one rescuing everybody else. So, uh, so it's a very close tie. Oh, I love that. I'm a huge Long Kiss Goodnight fan yeah. myself. And so is Luis in Argentina. Luis. He also says, I'm a big Long Kiss Goodnight and Cutthroat Island fan. Awesome. How was it to portray such strong female leads in action films back then? And how do you think those movies helped pave the way for more strong female leads in action movies nowadays? I love you. <laughs> uh, and I love that you, um, you know, are such a fan of those movies because because I am too. And uh, I, I really, really wanted to be in an action movie um, because because I I learned how to play baseball for Liga de Roma. I was very unathletic before that, or I thought that I was probably um, uncoordinated, and I just never wanted to try sports. And then I had to learn baseball to play that role. And I was kind of good at it. Um, learned very well how to, how to play. And then I had to learn, uh, you know, other, other um, uh, no, and, and, and so, so anyway, so this made me realize that I was uh, athletically gifted, let's say, uh, uh, at 36, because I had never known this before. And so then I was like determined that I wanted to play 
uh, and action role. And that's how I ended up meeting uh, Rennie Harlan, who directed both of those movies, was um, that I had specifically asked my agents or told them that I, you know, let's try to really get me in an action movie. So, um, so that's how all that happened. But it was so much fun. And, and I feel like who gets to be, uh, what, you know, female actor gets to be a pirate. And, and swashbuckle and have a monkey on your shoulder and all that stuff and uh and then you know to play an assassin and i really feel like um long kiss good night was ahead of his time we talk about other um uh, more current action movies starring women but it was very rare back then and uh but i got to do it i got to play one of the coolest parts that there was so i uh I loved it. I loved it. And I'm glad it, I, I'm not sure, but I'm glad if it um, encouraged more, uh, it let every, you know, helped usher in more action movies with women. Uh, I just want to be in them. Uh, I, I feel like, especially, uh, what was I thinking? A Wonder Woman, when that came in, I'm like, who is more of a, of a, uh, what's the word? Am Amazon Amazonian archer, because I'm so tall. Then, uh, then me. I actually know how to shoot archery, and I'm very, very big. So, uh, uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm holding out for a Marvel movie, some kind of Marvel part. But I want to do more. Love it. Um, and Patrice from Lowell, Massachusetts, says that her aunt played for several years in the AAGPBL. Um, and she loved hearing all her stories about it all the time. What did you most enjoy about playing Dottie in A League of Their Own? Uh, thank you. And I thought there's a whole chapter about A League of Their Own in here. I love that your aunt played. And, you know, we met a, a, a number of the women, a lot of the women, and, and uh, several of them were advisors on the movie that were on set, you know, so we could you know, learn everything from them. And, uh, and I loved it. I loved everything about it. I was so, um, you know, it was so shocking to be uh, in a movie about female athletes, female sports, because, I mean, what, you know, that, I, I couldn't think of any before. It's just something I never could have anticipated. And then I would get to play, uh, you know, the best baseball player anyone's ever seen uh, was very exciting. And I, and I loved it. I loved that um, the women on the actual team really bonded. We became, we, I mean, we're all still in touch and became a team and, uh, and, you know, getting to work with Tom Hanks and all that. But, but playing baseball was the deal, you know, that was, that was the remarkable thing. All right. Jennifer in Arizona, we're gonna take it back to the book. She said, what inspired you to write a memoir right now? Uh, Jennifer, it actually, it wasn't about, ah, oh, this is the moment that I'm gonna write a book. I, I've wanted to write one for like 10 or 15 years, but you know, I have a, a pretty bad case of ADD and I'm a champion procrastinator, and uh, and I never really got to doing it. But I, I kept making notes about it, I kept thinking about it, and and what it would be about kind of evolved over time. But uh, but before I wrote this, I finally realized what I wanted it to be about, and that's why I really did sit down to start writing it, which was um, which would be, which was that roles I played changed my life, that I was able to practice being someone bolder than I was, and that helped me actually become bolder in my real life. That's why I learned. Um, Eric in Colorado says, is there anything in your book that you were nervous for the world to read? Um, for the world to read? I don't think so. Uh, Eric, I, I actually waited, I wouldn't have written this book if my parents were still alive, let's say, because, you know, New Englanders are one segment of the population who really uh, keep things to themselves. You don't discuss things, you don't reveal things, and there was plenty about my life that my parents never knew 
you know, like my my brother um, in college had a girlfriend and and uh, started living with her, and you know told my parents and they were horrified and so worried and he started smoking and oh my god you know he's gonna die of cancer. All that stuff. So when I did the exact same things, I never told them about it. But uh, uh, and he was like, "How come I, you, you know, I confess and get all the grief, and you're you're the perfect child?" But um, but that's you know that was my goal to be the, the perfect child. So um, so I, I actually I there was there's nothing in here that I wasn't comfortable putting in. Actually, yeah. There's, there's there's nothing that I'm waiting uh, anxiously to see if, if people, uh, you know, if are shocked or not. I love this question. Stacy in Burbank, California, says, "What is the most bizarre thing you've ever eaten, and was it delicious?" You know, I'm not. Uh, thank you for that kind of question. But I. Uh, I'm not famous for being uh, adventurous uh, as far as food goes. Um, like I went uh, one of my first, uh, on a first date, someone took me to uh, a very uh, fancy Japanese restaurant. The chef you didn't order anything. He would just send out some sushi and then a little while later send it out. And it was all like, the face is still on it. It was very, very weird and exotic stuff. And, uh, and I, oh, I can't tell what it is, but I'm going to eat it. Uh, so that, uh, honestly, I can't think of something weird. I wish I, I could say, you know, a little, uh, you know something, something funny that, uh, that I could tell you about. But, uh, <laughs> um, oh, it looks like Chris here uh, has a personal connection. He's in Rochester, Massachusetts, and he says, Hello, Gina. Met you in the late 90s when we were caretaking the Dr. Lincoln home, and you came over and saw the horses. Still have fun photos of you hugging our nugget. Always enjoyed saying hi to your parents when walking by. Great couple. Do you still miss the homestead? Yeah, do you still miss the homestead and town? Do you ever go back? Thanks and continued success. Oh, that's so cool. Hi, hi, Chris. So, um, yes, I do. You know, uh, we still have that house, my brother and I, and he's uh, he's living there half the year. He, he lives in there, actually. Right? I still visit all the time. And, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of people don't get to, to own the house that they grew up in, but, but we do it. And, and the Lincoln house, I visited every day when I was a kid because I had a newspaper room, and that was the apex of my room. It was just the, the Lincoln house, and uh, and I went there all the time. When I was when I was little, there was a horse there, but they would let us uh, us neighborhood kids ride. So, um, but anyway, thanks for giving it to us, and uh, you. All right, uh, Julia in Venice, Florida, says, "What experience of yours has surprised you the most?" Experience. Uh, let's think. Uh, I guess. Well, yes, definitely. Uh, being an honors exchange student to Sweden, my senior year in high school, my. My high school started the program when I was a junior, announced that they were going to start doing this, and I immediately wanted to sign up and beg my parents that we find a way to pay for me to be able to do this because I just wanted to go somewhere. I didn't know uh, that it was going to be Sweden. I didn't care. I just I wanted, and I think it was because I was kind of a geek kid, uh, and uh, you know, I made all my own clothes and stuff. And, Thought that I could reinvent myself if I went somewhere else, or at least not have a reputation of being kind of an oddball. Uh, so I signed up. I'm going to go, and uh, and 
as I'm, we're sitting on the tarmac that haven't taken off yet, I'm waving to my parents in the window, and I'm like, wait a minute. In other words, I'm not going to see a single person I know for a year. And so before the plane took off, I was regretting it. I was oh no, and called my parents the second I got to the to the house of the family and said I want to come home, and um, and I didn't. I stuck it. I stuck out the year, but uh, but that was very surprising. And I realized, hey, I didn't think this through at all. I just wanted to do this. And then the other surprise, giant surprise, was two days later after I got there, I started in Swedish high school, which is in Swedish, which I didn't speak a word of, obviously. And so I was like, and sitting in the first class, like, wait a minute, how, how's this supposed to work? Did anybody think about how this is going to work? Um, and so I went up to the teacher after the first class and said, do you know what I'm supposed to do? She said, no, I've been thinking about that. I have no idea. I can't teach the class in English. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. Good luck. But here's here's the homework assignment. And it was read five pages or whatever in a, in a book, history. And so I went home and looked up every single word of the assignment in a dictionary. And uh, and but then I you know with total immersion if you ever do that or have done that it really works you know because within a few months I was able to like think in Swedish and uh, by Christmas I was dreaming in Swedish so uh, uh, so it, you know it all turned out to be a, a fantastic experience and um, and very useful when maybe once a year I run into a Swede and can talk to them in Swedish. But uh but that was it was uh, it was shocking how little thought had gone into into this experience that I had. <laughs> Is that story in the book? Is it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the book. yeah. There, there's more Swedish stuff in there. Oscar in Fremont, California says, hello, Miss Davis, a big fan of your acting and looking forward to reading your book. How long did it take you to write this book? And do yourself, do you see yourself writing more books in the future? Uh, hey, Oscar, um, it took two years to write it, which I understand is uh, not slow, uh, that, that it can often take uh, longer, more, more years to, to write a book, but it took, it took about two years. And I think I had a little bit of a head start because I've been thinking about it for so long. Um, but uh, 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 the second, what was the second part of the... Um, do you see yourself writing more books in the future? Oh, funny you should ask, because I have, a, uh, uh, I have another book that I'm starting to write. Right after this, I've sold um, a children's book idea and uh i'm going to do the illustrations as well because i kind of uh, i don't know if i draw a cartoon and so uh, uh and it's called um the girl who was it will be called the girl who was too big for the page and the idea is that um that there's a girl who lives in a book and but she knows she lives in a book and she knows that people are looking at the book so she, it's almost like to camera and she's you know she's does everything to camera, uh, and she goes away for a summer uh, in third grade or whatever. And when she comes back to the front of the page, she can't see the people anymore. Maybe like, there's some people, and then she looks looks down, and then she can see the people, and she realizes she's become too tall to fit in her own book. So it's her. Uh, exploits after that and how she comes to deal with that and uh yeah i'm gonna be drawing the pictures too so it's gonna be fun that is really fun that's so cute Sounds cute. Right? Desiree has a quick comment. She's in Miami, Florida, and she doesn't have a question, but she just wanted to let you know that she named her son after you, Davis. And she says, keep being awesome. Wait, she, said, Nate, Nate. she named her son after Nate. you, Davis. Oh, I thought you were saying she was just Gina. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Uh, thank you. I mean, 
me literally after me i guess that's right? what she not says <laughs> not that it happened he happened to be named david wow that's for cool. <laughs> if he had a girl would chip a name to me we wonder some people have been named doing it with my spelling and i have to think maybe it's because of me uh but thank you very much <laughs> Mark, and I think this is Coburg, Ontario, Canada, says, as Canadians, we are often called polite. What is your favorite experience north of the border? Thank you for sharing your light with the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so, yeah, I've had a lot of great experiences in Canada. I've shot uh, several movies in Canada and, uh, and a whole and a TV show I shot this a TV show, The Exorcist, a TV show about The Exorcist, where, if you had never saw it, it was a few, couple of few years ago, uh, in the fifth episode, you find out, should I give it away? Uh, it, in the fifth episode, you know, it, it, it takes place in the same world that the movie took place in, and uh, in the fifth episode, you find out that I'm grown up Reagan. Uh, and it's quite shocking to find that out. And, and so there's you know, a lot of stuff. But anyway, but that, that was a great um, experience. I shot The Fly there, which was an incredible experience. And uh, the most Canadian experience I had was shooting Long Kiss Goodnight in Toronto because it was in the middle of winter and a lot of it was at night. And it was so cold and my character being a badass uh, uh, uh the director my then husband said you can't zip your coat because you're too cool and it looks cooler because... so i had like a one of those thin ribbed tank tops on and a parka that was open and, and i would say i think this is the scene where she you know, she finally zips up her, no, you're not going to zip up the park. And so, oh man, there were nights, you know, with the wind chill and everything, easily 20 below over and over and over. And everybody else is like, you can't even see them in all their giant clothes. But uh, but I'm like laying on the pavement. They have to heat it with a, with a heater before I lay down in case my face stuck to the, to the pavement. But, um, but I, I love Canada. I actually really do. Um, so you've mentioned, you've told us the story behind the cover of your book, uh, but Barbara in California wants to know what or who inspired the title of your book. I came up with that title and what inspired it was, um, you know, uh, when it became clear what the book was going to be about, the journey, what journey it was going to describe, uh, it, it, it occurred to me that, that um, an incident that happened to me when I was a kid kind of illustrated where I came from, where, you know, where I started from on my journey to badassery. And uh, I'll just tell it to you, because um, there's lots of other good stuff in the book, but I'll tell you about this. Uh, I was eight years old, and my parents and I were in the back seat of a car uh, driven by my great uncle Jack and Aunt Marion is in the passenger seat and Uncle Jack is driving and he's 99 years old and it's at night and he's got these giant goggles on because uh, probably couldn't see it very well at 99 and we're on this very very narrow road blessedly uh, deserted at that time because he kept weaving into the oncoming traffic lane and then weaving back and just just going down the road kind of a, like that and uh, my parents didn't say anything and but eventually uh, i was sitting right behind it okay my mom picked me up and put me in between my parents so that i would die a little less when we had our head-on collision i guess and oh, we just sat there and nobody said anything about this um and uh i mean not even just like hey maybe you want to you know uh steer a little for, you know stay in your lane um forget about saying 
oh my God, you're going to kill us all, pull over. You know, they said, my parents said nothing. And then finally, a car is coming uh, in the other lane and there's nowhere for them to pull off. And there we go, we veer into the oncoming traffic lane and nobody says a peep. Their parents are just sitting there. And uh, I can't remember if I was aware that I was gonna die within a second or what, or that I just felt like, well, this is what we're, this is our collective reaction to it. We're not gonna have any reaction. And, uh, and then finally, at the last instant, Aunt Marion says, a little to the right, Jack. And he veers just in time for the car to streak past us, like maybe eight inches away from us. And, uh, and so we my, I realized later, of course, in hindsight, that, my, that we very likely were going to die of being polite. Of being polite, and and it, it didn't even have to be impolite. It could have been the same. My dad could have said a little to the right, Jack, uh, himself. But calling anybody out on anything was the last thing my parents would do. And I, I guess I have to really admit that they were willing to die and kill their child <laughs> rather than than say anything to. The 99 year old <laughs> goodness <laughs> um well okay here's a great question from facebook cammy rutherford says um do you think politeness stifles creativity on a societal level yes you know right because you know the word politeness sounds like saying please and thank you and, and being polite but what um what I'm talking about is the phenomenon of not asserting yourself, being very self-effacing, that in order to be liked uh, or be a good person, you have to uh, hide your needs. You can't be outspoken about anything. You can't, uh, for God's sake, put anybody out, you know, need anything from anybody. Um, and it definitely stifles creativity. It stifles your life. I mean, it informs your entire life, if, especially if you were deeply, uh, uh, you know, impacted by, by feeling like I have to be like, and women, you know, have this problem more often than, than men do of feeling like the way to be not liked and accepted and that people want to work with you or whatever, be friends with you is by being nice. And no trouble and accommodating and, and all that. So um, so it definitely starts with creativity because maybe there's something you want to do, but you're afraid to do it or, you know, embarrassed to do it or um, don't want to ask somebody how to do it. I had that bad. I, I, all, every possible job I ever had, I didn't want to ask anybody how to do it. And uh, that got me in some, some real fixes, but... Um, but yeah, it, it definitely, I mean, everybody should be able to come to realize it's okay to say what I think. It's okay to live authentically, which is my goal. Well, that brings me to Tori in California's question, because you just commented on it, but I guess this would be an advice question. She says, how do I stop caring about what others think of me? Right. It's... Um, it's a journey. Well, by reading this book, <laughs> you will find all the clues and tips to living an authentic life. Um, you're always going to care uh, what people think of you. You're going to always care uh, that your friends and your family and everybody um, like you and, and, and all that. But uh, but it can be crippling, as, as it sounds like you know. Um, I would say just, um, just practice. Well, first of all, first of all, it's very important to get rid of, or try, start to get rid of negative self-talk because I was in my forties until I realized that I was doing it, which is, you know, having a running commentary in your mind saying, oh God, 
they they think you're stupid. Uh, I am stupid. Uh, you know, people are gonna laugh at me. Uh, um, so and so is not gonna like me. I fucked that up. I you know whatever. Um, and uh, uh, you know, judging, judging, judging yourself constantly. And I was constantly. Um, and I learned that I was doing that while I was learning archery in my 40s. But but then I realized I was doing it all day, every day. And the way I started addressing it with archery was I, I pay much more attention, actively pay attention to what my brain was saying. And if it said, um, you suck at archery or whatever it would be, I'd say, I'd say back to it, no, I don't. I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing a good job. And, and I started doing that as much as I could. And I still, I still do it because it, I still, of course, sometimes have that happen. But, um, but it, that changed a lot for me. It really made a huge difference in how I felt about myself. You know, that I, I wasn't, it was bad enough. The world is bad enough, there's enough hardships without punishing yourself, you know, torturing yourself. So, uh, uh, so I think that's, that's one um, important step because the more confident you can feel about yourself and forgiving of yourself, I'm doing a good job. I mean, I just started to sort of regularly say, I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing okay. And uh, you'll be more likely to value what you think and say what you think and share it and you know just try stuff out try uh saying something let's say you're in a situation you want to maybe go work or whatever and you want to say something think ahead and try saying it without putting in front of it i don't know if this is a good idea i don't know if this is probably dumb but you know because my whole life was a string of those kind of phrases before everything i said but but start practicing doing that, and uh, and you'll see that there's not some big reaction from other people because you didn't put yourself down before you said uh, what you thought, you know. And so that's a, that's a good way is if if you can um, find occasions to think about it beforehand or stop yourself as you're saying this is probably dumb, um, and uh, it'll it'll it should help. And even this book, Dying of Politeness. And where can they get really us? Help with all of that. There's secrets in here I can't share with you right now. And where can they get a signed copy of this book? To get a signed copy of this book? You mean by me personally signing it? I think there's a place you could try called premiercollectibles.com slash forward slash politeness premier p-r-e-m-i-e-r-e -E -E, collectibles i think they're doing that <laughs> i think i'm actually going to be signing some books so. perfect all right one more fan question and then we'll play a quick game um fran mitchell says fran, you said? fran yes uh, what was the motivation behind going into the Olympics to compete in archery? Thanks for shining a light on the sport, by the way. Oh, maybe you play, Fred. Uh, so I said, as I said before, I had to learn how to play baseball for the role that I was playing in the League of Their Own. And then in the two action movies I did, I also had to learn uh sword fighting and horseback riding and taekwondo and uh pistol shooting um and ice skating and then pistol shooting while ice skating so and i was kind of good at all of it which was all and it was all so much fun to to learn how to do these stunts and i mean the, these skills of sports so uh i decided that i wanted to try to learn a sport in the real life way and not the movie version of it because uh, uh for example in league of their own when we were shooting close-ups of our batting it was just a squishy ball we couldn't we couldn't hit hard balls at the crew so uh they, they didn't want us to 
um, kill them. So, uh, so it wasn't really real. Uh, you know, it was already predetermined who was going to, you know, win the games and all that. And I thought, I wonder if I could take up a real sport. So I then saw archery, uh, a lot of it during the Olympics in um, 96 in Atlanta on TV. And they were showing it a lot because the men's American team was winning and they showed the guy that got all the gold medals uh, practicing in his yard and all that. And I thought, wow, you know, it's just very beautiful. It's very dramatic. And I wonder if I would be good at that. So I found a coach. I was 41 and took it up and went insane and became utterly obsessed with it. And my coach, embarrassingly, I, I tell you, my coach claims that at the very first lesson, I said, how old is too old to go to the Olympics in archery? Because evidently I wanted to pick a sport that would that it would be possible to go to the Olympics in it. Uh, but I, I hadn't even touched a bow yet, so this is all ridiculous. But two and a half years later, I was a semi-finalist for the Olympic trials. And uh, which was remarkable at, at 43 to suddenly find myself at the Olympic trials was crazy and amazing and so much fun. And, and uh, so that's how that, that's how that all came about. <laughs> Love that. All right. So now we're going to play a quick game called 22 questions in two minutes. A long time ago. <laughs> oh, I wondered if a fan came up with it or not. No, just the folks at live signing. All right, I better pay attention now. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Where were you born? We're in Massachusetts. Uh, who would you want to play you in a movie? Uh -huh. uh, 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 Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> uh, what was your first job? As, um, well, newspaper group. But my first uh, sort of job job was uh, in the in a department store called Grants in the credit department. Uh, and I was only 16 and I was deciding if people could buy a refrigerator on credit. And they said they hired me because I was the only uh, applicant who'd ever known what a gross was. And uh, so they thought I must be a genius or something. <laughs> I'm supposed to answer just like one word. It's fine. Yeah, sure. I love the stories. Yeah. Uh, what chore do you hate do, doing? What chores did I grow up doing? Or what, what chore do you hate doing? Oh, I, uh, everything. Everything. Um, I, uh, I bought a basket that's meant to be on stairs. It actually shaped like this so it can be at the bottom of the stairs. You, put what, you know, I'm going to bring this up later or whatever. And it's just full and overflow. I don't even know what's in it anymore uh, because I don't bother to just grab the stuff and bring it upstairs. Yeah, I'm a terrible, terrible procrastinator. Uh, what is your biggest fear? Um, you know, I'm not afraid of a lot. I'm really not. I, I was, you'll see, read in the book, I was afraid of everything. As a kid growing up, I was afraid. I was a hypo very, very serious hypochondriac. I was very superstitious um, and had a lot of rituals that I had to do. Uh, I had a lot of monsters in my childhood all over the house. And, and I was afraid a lot, but I've grown to become not afraid of anything. I mean, I'm, I, when, if there's a spider in the kids' room, that, and the kids are all afraid of spiders, I'm like, let me at the spider. Come on, because I, I I really enjoy not being afraid of stuff. You know, looking at gory things and um, not having to look away, and and uh, it's it's just it's very rewarding to me, and I and I like it. Um, who makes you laugh the most? My friend, whose name is Gavin De Becker, uh, and he and I were boyfriend and girlfriend at one point uh, years ago, but uh, but he makes me 
left one of them. And he's just he's so fun. And that's why I first, you know, fell, fell in love with him. Well, we were friends first and then became uh, lovers, but, uh, but still, it's, it's the person that makes me laugh the most. So fun. Um, what is the one thing you need to have in your fridge at all times? Milk, because I live on cereal. I have to always have milk. Um, and sometimes there's only milk and then a lot of different kinds of cereal. Because I'm so, well, I'm so lazy about grocery shopping too. Uh, but I will go to the store if we don't, if we don't have milk. Um, what was your favorite subject in school? Um, English, writing, that, uh, yes, that was definitely my favorite. Actually, actually, right, I, I didn't even think about that, but that was my favorite subject. I loved writing stories from when I was really little. I loved to write stories, so how would I never not think about that? I should have <laughs> put it in the book. <laughs> Uh, who is the most interesting person you've met recently? Recently. Wait. Uh, well, I don't, I, I don't know. Last night I met Carly Kloss Klo uh, at a party, uh, which I rarely go to. Uh, that was super fun because she's like 6'2". And... Uh, and you know, I'm six feet, and it's so rare to ever meet a woman that's that's taller than me. I met two women who were over six feet yesterday, and uh, I, if you're tall, you know that it's kind of like belonging to a club, where you have to talk to each other or you have to acknowledge each other. It's it's very strange, but you you, you never miss uh, an opportunity to talk about what it's like to both be that tall. <laughs> I love that. What is your middle name? Virginia Elizabeth is what I was named after my two aunts. My mother's sister was uh, Virginia and my father's sister was Elizabeth. So I was named Virginia Elizabeth, but I was always from the very beginning nicknamed Gina. Um, what is your biggest pet peeve? Um, uh, I'm, I'm a little peevy about grammatical errors. <laughs> I mean, not necessarily in my friends, but like if I'm reading something and uh, someone puts, uh, you know what? The specific thing that is my pet peeve is when people put a comma when all they mean is possessive. Uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, multiple. You know, you put a comma when it's Gina's book, but uh, if you want to say there's two Gina's, you just put an S, but so many people put comma S uh, when they mean to, you know, just multiples of something. And that is my pet peeve. Spoken like someone who likes writing. Yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite hobby? Uh, I am, have a lot of hobbies, and my, I, I would call myself a crafty person um, because I always want to be making something, and I always um, have ideas for things to make. And um, it's coming on pumpkin season right now, and I'm obsessed with pumpkin carving. And so I'm always happy when October rolls around. And I have the Martha Stewart pumpkin carving kit which I highly recommend. You're welcome, Martha, uh, because you can do this carving on a pumpkin where you don't cut through the whole thing. You just sort of etch a pattern on the outside of it, and then when the light, it'll it'll shine through and have this sort of orange glow. Uh, so, and the pumpkin won't go rotten until you actually open it to put the candle in. So, uh, so that's uh, you could say right now that that is my hobby. <laughs> Do you have any hidden talents? Um, I have a lot of talents. Uh, <laughs> let me think if any of them are hidden. Um, um, uh, I can, well, well, I can um, raise uh, my eyebrows separately and, and uh, 
And I taught myself how to do that because when I was a kid, I always knew that I, from minute one that I wanted to be an actor. And I had the flu one time and I was home laying on the couch all week watching soap operas. And I realized at the ends of scenes, people very often went, you know, like, <laughs> you know how people stop talking at the end of the scene. And it was your brother. So I decided, well, actors clearly need to be able to raise their eyebrows. So I sat there and watched TV holding down one eyebrow for about two or three days. And then I and then I realized sometimes the camera's on the other side. Right? So then I trained myself to raise raise the other one separately. But I also, and there's no way to teach yourself to do this, I think, I can wiggle my ears separately. And you probably won't be able to tell um, on my camera. I don't know how close you are. Uh, where's the shot? I'm like, are you doing it? <laughs> but I can't. I can wiggle just one and then just the other. Do you have a guilty pleasure? Um, I feel guilty that I eat dessert so much. Um, and, and it is very pleasurable. Um, <laughs> and I also feel embarrassed-ish that I can eat dessert every day and not kind of worry about it. I just have, I just feel like, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I always, always want dessert. No matter what meal it is, even <laughs> I want dessert. Uh, what's your pet's name, or do you have a pet? Pets. Uh, I have a dog named Boo, B O O, a cat named Carla, randomly, and a donkey named Donkey Hody. <laughs> her, her real name is Hody, but it's Donkey Hody. Love that. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. You you like English and writing. Do you have a favorite word? Do I? I can't think of what that would be. Uh, I don't know. I love words. I've always had, I, I like having a, a generous vocabulary. I have to, maybe I can come back to that. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was the last album you bought or streamed? Album? Mm hmm. Music? Mm -hmm. Oh, I I haven't bought an album. <laughs> or streamed, or streamed. Do you like? Do you like? Or streamed, like on Spotify or Apple oh, Music. Oh, I see. You know, it's, I only um, I listened to the whole um, new Beyonce album because uh, my daughter is such a huge fan, so I listened to it with her. But I just play individual songs. Well, okay. The, the album that I have listened to the most in my life, and it's countless times, is the uh, the cast album to Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> and I know every word, every note in that. I've listened to it over a hundred times. I'm positive, at least over a hundred times. I love that. Um, what is the last gift you gave? Um, well, a book, <laughs> one of these books, um, let me think before that, let me think before that, oh, I know what it was, uh, I found, somebody gave me, uh, a few years ago, this little pouch, uh, a sort of a knitted pouch, and inside is a, a, a nice, a thin blanket for, on the plane. To, to, you know, cover yourself up. And it also had uh, an eye mask in it. And so I have loved this thing over the years. I always bring it on the plane. And I saw online uh, similar, very similar things. So I bought um, one of those for each th three of my girlfriends. I love that. All right, three more. Uh, what cause is dear to your heart? So, uh, so many things, but, but um, the, nearest to my heart is my institute, um, which I don't think we talked about, right? But um, I, I launched an institute to research gender depictions in kids' media, and this was 18 years ago, um, because, and it, 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 I talk all about this in the book, but when my daughter was two years old, I decided, hey, now we can watch preschool shows, you know, this is going to be fun, and sat down with her to watch, and 
immediately realized that there were far more male characters than female characters in something made for little kids. And I thought, you know, as a mother, I thought, well, surely in the 21st century, we should be showing kids that boys and girls share the sandbox equally. And there shouldn't be any kids' shows where there's not gender balance, you know? So, and then I saw it in a movie that came out and the videos that we rented, and it was everywhere. And I couldn't find anybody who noticed, not my girlfriends, my feminist girlfriends with daughters, and not anyone in the entertainment industry. I asked so many people if they noticed that that was true. And they all said, no, no, that's not true anymore. And, um, and I realized then that it was unconscious, that it was completely unconscious because they all told me how passionately they cared about gender issues. And especially because we make kids stuff and all this. And so then I thought, if I was able to bring them the data I wonder if that would have an impact on them because they, if they knew, in other words, because they clearly don't know. And uh, it turned out that that was the golden key to making change in that um, in that area. Because once I started bringing the and I and I do it very privately. I don't bust anybody publicly ever. Um, I say, hey, can I come by and uh, share some some things with you that I don't think you know and. Uh, and they're stunned. Uh, people are absolutely stunned, especially, and it works because the people who make children's entertainment love kids. That's where they're doing it. And they're horrified to find out that they're doing, they're not doing right by half of the population. So um, in the 18 years I've been doing it, we've actually reached parity in the lead characters in children's TV and movies. Uh, in other words, 50-50 male and female lead characters, which is wildly different from what it was when we started. So, so it's um, it's working. I mean, we have a, other work to do, but um, it's very exciting. Um, what is your greatest achievement? I shouldn't be surprised by these questions. I mean, it seems typical of what one might ask. My greatest achievement. Um, Becoming more of who I was supposed to be. I think. Love that. All right. And the last one, where do you want to go that you've never been? Oh, I've been everywhere. Um, let me think. Where do I want to go? Um, you know, well, New Zealand. I've been to Australia a million times, but um, but I've never been to New Zealand, and I hear that it's incredible. You know, just so beautiful. Costa Rica, I've never been to. One of my sons has been there, and I hear that is extraordinary as well. You know, extraordinary and beautiful. Um, that, those would be good choices. All right. Well, that completes the questions. Do you want to wrap up for the people? Oh well. Thank you for, for listening. Thanks for those really good questions. I've been doing interviews promoting the book, and uh, y'all asked some very good questions, like things that clearly nobody else had asked me. So I, I appreciate that. And um, thanks for listening in. Very exciting. Uh, remember, if you would like an autograph book, I got to finish. I got to finish all these books, and the ones you order, um, premiercollectibles.com forward slash politeness. And I very politely thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.